afternoon or good morning, depending on what time zone you are in. This is the error rate cohort call, and we are going to start in just a minute once the clock hits 2 Eastern, because we do have a lot to cover. Thank you for joining, and um, we will get started very shortly. All right, the clock just hit two o'clock for me, so I am going to get started. Um, my name is Katie Watts. I am the error rate lead with the National Center on Subsidy Innovation and Accountability. And I am glad to be here today to conduct this error rate training for, um, for year three states and a couple of year one states I think are here as well. So welcome to all of you. Um, a couple of logistical items. Um, I did send out the slides to everyone who was registered. If you did not get them, they are available in the handouts box. If you still can't get them, um, you know, I'm happy to email them out to you after the webinar so that you have them. If you do have any questions, um, you can raise your hand or you can enter your question in the questions box on your dashboard. And we will um, hopefully be able to take a few minutes to address any questions that come in. Again, we have a lot to cover. So, um, but you know, we're, if whatever we cannot get to during the call, we can certainly follow up with you afterwards. So again, I am Katie Watts. I'm the Air Rate Lead with the Subsidy Center and the Air Rate uh, Specialist with uh, most of the regions except for one in seven. And with me today is Janae Williams, who works with me on the Air Rate um, in Region 7 and also supporting me in all other sorts of Air Rate things. So thank you for joining us, Janae. Glad and to also, be here. My, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And also a quick call out to our friends at the Office of Child Care, the central office. We have Aidy Fitcher and Linda Wining. Um, they won't be, well, they won't be speaking up now, but if, depending on what questions come in, they might speak up at some point. And also hello to the ACF regional offices that are on the call. We're always glad to have you. And here is a map of the year three cohort. So you can see um, your state and your other uh, friends that are on the call. Like I also, like I mentioned a little bit ago, we also have a couple of year ones on here, which are not filled in, but um, you know, we're of course glad to have you too. All right, so I know I already said it a couple times, but I'll say it one more time. We do have a lot to cover today for this training. Um, and here's just the agenda um, to reference. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit about proposed changes to the data collection instructions. The year three cohort is always kind of in a funny place where we change the data collection instructions every three years, and it's always just at the time that the year three cohort is reporting. So we did want to speak a little bit about what the changes are and how it might affect the year three cohort. Then I'm going to hand it over to Janae, who's going to talk about a few uh, important pointers for case record reviews, some general uh, things that often come up. And then I'm going to discuss um, record review worksheet just give some training on completing columns two three and four and then we'll also uh, get a little bit into the additional inquiry and mid table and finish up by um, doing a little training on completing element 500 of the record review worksheet and then we will finish off with you know the usual next steps and talking about um, 
what TA support we can offer the cohort as they conduct reviews. All right. Um, whenever I do a webinar, I always like to show the timeline just so that everyone can kind of orient themselves to where we are in the process at the moment. So the year three cohort, your case review period um, ran from October of 2020 through September of 2021. So that's where you're going to be drawing your cases from that period. Or if you've already review, been reviewing cases, this is where you drew your cases from. The last day to submit the sampling decisions, assurances, and fieldwork preparation plan via the OLDC was yesterday. And the last day to submit your customized record review worksheet, which a lot of a lot of the year three states have already done, so that's awesome. But if you haven't, that's fine. The last day to submit it is going to be December 31st of 2021. And then moving into 2022. Um, the last day to submit the state and proper payments report, also known as the 404, is June 30th of 2022. And if you do end up needing to complete a corrective action plan based on what your error rate is, that is going to be um, submitted within 60 days of the deadline for submitting the 404. That takes us to around August of 2022. All right, so let's get into um, the agenda items first with the proposed changes to the data collection instructions. So the data collection instructions, or DCI, as we call it for short, they are revised or renewed every three years. The last revision was in autumn of 2018. So the current templates, if you want to take a look at the SDAP template or the record review, record review worksheet template, they have an expiration date in the top right corner of them, which says October 31st, 2021, which of course was yesterday. Um, we have extended, or we, we will be extending this expiration date to November 30th of 2021 because the new version is still being finalized. So we're hoping that this will be approved by the end of this month so that this new DCI, the changes, and the new templates will all have an effective date of December 1st. Um, this iteration of the DCI does have, again, some updates and changes that we're proposing, which I'll mention in the next couple of slides. Um, mostly the good news, I guess, is that the changes are all fairly minor. As soon as the DCI is approved, we will be posting it on the Office of Child Care's website, and we also will send it to the regional offices, and then we'll in turn distribute it to the error rate leads in each of the lead agencies. So the first set of proposed changes to the new data collection instructions involves the sampling decisions, assurances, and fieldwork prep plan, which is also known as the SDAP. There's a new item on obtaining documents stored by other entities outside of the lead agencies. And um, there's also the very last item of the SDAP about case review logistics. It used to be kind of one big item. Now we've broken it down into a few sub items. So for all of you, the year three cohort, um, just take a note what I have here in bold. This should not affect any of the year three cohort. So your you know, last data submit the FDAP was yesterday. Um, you've you know, sent them in. Well, I think most of them have already been approved. So you do not need to do anything further. You do not need to use this new template. For the few year ones that are on the call, uh, I know some of you have also submitted your SDAP already, so you're good. If you have not yet submitted your SDAP, if you you know go ahead and upload it to the OLDC after November 30th, you would want to be using that new template. 
So it just kind of depends on when you submit it. But again, for the vast majority of you, the three, the year threes, you don't need to do anything. So the second set of proposed changes concerns the record review worksheet template. Again, just very minor updates to a couple of things in element 350. We've changed the title and also I think we took like a few words out of the boilerplate. Um, so how is this going to affect those of you on the call? So for the year three states, we've already submitted your customized record review worksheet or if you're planning to submit it in the next you know, in the next few weeks before November 30th, you don't need to do anything. Just if you haven't submitted it yet, you can do it on the current template that is um, in the current version of the DCI. If you've already submitted it, you don't need to go back and change anything. You can continue conducting your reviews on the template that you've had approved. However, if you do submit either in the year three or the year one cohort, if you go ahead and send it to us after November 30th, then we would want to make you would want to make sure that you're using the new template and again very minor changes just a couple of tweaks in element 350 if you were around the last time we changed the dci the changes were a lot more um major so this this is uh hopefully gonna be a lot easier for everyone So a few more areas where we have proposed changes. First is just conducting case reviews in general, the processes for conducting case record reviews. The scope of the additional inquiry has expanded a bit. If you're new to the error rate review, you may not know what I mean when I say additional inquiry, but we'll discuss this later in the webinar. For the uh, 404 report, I we don't have any changes to the items themselves. There's just some additional instructions on the pooling factor item. And then finally, for the corrective action plan, again, this submission is only required for those states that have an error rate exceeding 10%. So fingers crossed, none of you will have to complete one. But if so, there again, there's a couple of, of really minor revisions. Um, the title is changing. It was Error Rate Review Corrective Action Plan. We're updating that to the State and Proper Payments Corrective Action Plan. And there's a couple of revisions to um, how some of the information is presented in items one and three. And even if you do have to do a cap, you know, this is kind of a long way off, so I'm not going to get too in depth here. If you do end up needing to do one, we, we will provide individual TA on how to complete these items. So if you've had the DCI, if you've been thinking about the DCI changes, I know we've gotten some emails about it, how it might affect the cohort. Um, you know, if you do have any outstanding questions, please feel free to reach out to us. And otherwise, we will make sure that the DCI gets into everyone's hands when it is approved. So for the next portion of the webinar, I am going to uh, hand it over to Janae Williams. Janae? Yep, thanks, Katie. All right, so for the next portion of the webinar, we want to touch on a couple of important pointers uh, for conducting case reviews. So these are some things that we sometimes run into when we're conducting joint case reviews. So we wanted to address them now before, as most of you are starting your reviews. So we'll be discussing front end versus back end errors, and also speaking a little bit about what happens when other entities are involved in the eligibility process. So first, front end, or Front end error, front end versus back end error. Sorry, couldn't get my words out. These are terms that you will often hear us using. So we want to let you guys know what's, what we mean by them. So when we talk about front end errors, we are referring to those errors that happen during eligibility process. This can mean something that happens at eligibility determination or redetermination 
or case actions that are taken after that determination or redetermination. These errors are the responsibility of the eligibility workers or eligibility agency, and they may affect the type of care or hours of care or a subsidy amount that is authorized. These are the type of errors that we look at during the error rate review. Now the back-end errors, back-end errors on the other hand, are not include, included in the current review process. These are errors that are occurring after eligibility has been determined and the subsidy amount has been authorized. These include and are not limited to errors with issuing payment, time and attendance errors, or provider billing errors. If you run into an error like this, the lead agency will still want to look at this, of course, but they are not to be included in the error rate review process. All right, so now what we'll do is we'll take a couple of minutes to do a little quiz on front end and back end errors. You guys can use your chat box to respond or the question and answer box if you'd like. But first, we'd, let's say, let's start off with this first uh, question here. Let's say that you have a case where the parent is working 40 hours per week and needs full-time care for their child. However, the, error rate, the eligibility worker authorizes part-time care. Would this be a front-end or back-end error? Well, looks like we have some answers here, front end, front end. And those of you who have answered front end error, you are correct. This would be considered a front end error. Let's try another one. Here we have an eligibility worker that correctly authorizes full-time care but due to an error in the billing system, the provider is only reimbursed for part-time care. Is this a front-end or back-end error? Awesome, you are correct. This is a back-end error. The key phrase here is that the eligibility worker correctly authorizes full-time care, right? That should tip you off that the purpose for purposes of this review, there is no error and the issue occurred on the back end. Let's try another one here. Uh, the eligibility worker here correctly authorizes full-time care, but due to an error in the billing process, the provider is only reimbursed Hold on one second, that's not the same. So for this one, the family is responsible for a $50 copay. The eligibility system incorrectly processes the authorization leading to no copay actually being applied to the case. Is this a front end or a back end error? Sorry, I mixed up the examples, Janae. That's okay, I caught it. <laughs> I see, that's all right. And we have front end and back end posted as the response. And this one is actually a tricky one. So, and that's why we did uh, put this one in here. So this one is actually a front end error. Is that correct, Katie? I wanna say it is. Yes, and I, again, apologize for the confusion. I. Uh... I'm giving genomic signals here. <laughs> <laughs> so that's yeah, okay. That yeah, this one's a this one's actually a front end error, and the reason being is because of the eligibility system. Um, the lead agency is still responsible, and the eligibility system is part of the eligibility determination process, right? So for this one, it was actually a front end error. Yeah, this one is a little tricky because um, it's, you know, the term system, a lot of times we think that back, that back end error, the eligibility worker did everything right, um, and presumably they did input everything into the system right, but still the error occurred at the time of determination and the authorization. So that's uh, why this would be a front end. Well, 
All right, we can move to the next one. And the last one here is another uh, one of the items that we got, we'd like to uh, share with you guys today. And it's addressing documentation for other entities. So of course we're switch switching gears here just a bit. And let's see here, we're talking about what to do when other entities are involved in the eligibility process. So in many states, parts of the eligibility are carried out by an entity separate from the lead agency or a separate department within the lead agency. For example, provider licensing is handled by another department or, and this is one we see most often, the protective services cases are handled by another agency and referrals are sent to the lead agency for those cases. And those children referred are considered eligible. These types of situations may lead to documentation issues. For example, the worker from the lead agency isn't directly making the eligibility decision and therefore, therefore does not have documentation for, for instance, protective services cases. So this may mean that parts of the record review worksheet could not be completed or they are just automatically considered an error. However, there, here are a few things that we'd like for you guys to keep in mind. So first, that the CCDF lead agency is ultimately responsible for implementation of the grant, including portions that are carried out by others or other agencies or departments. And these portions that are carried out by others are still subject to the error rate review process. So what does that mean for your reviews? So in short, it means that those conducting the reviews still must be able to demonstrate that eligibility decisions made by other entities were done correctly. Reviewers should be able to access, access documentation of those reviewers and lead agencies should ultimately have proper controls in place to ensure that those eligibility determinations are completed accurately. So if you have any questions regarding these or concerns, uh, please reach out. We do encourage you guys to reach out to your regional office. And I think I'll stop here, Katie. And we can also stop and see if there are any questions regarding uh, this information. Any questions or comments? I don't think anything has come in. All right, well, I will turn it back over yeah. to you, Katie. All right, thank you, Janae. And this is one area that, um, again, I, like Janae mentioned, we've seen this come up on a lot of joint case reviews, and it is addressed a little bit more in the data, in the new data collection instructions. So this is something that, um, you know, is, is coming up more and more. So we just wanted to make sure that we are addressing that. All right. So actually, maybe a question did come in. Let's see. Errors made by outside agencies utilizing CCDF. Okay, this is the question, sorry. Errors made by outside agencies utilizing CCDF funds is the responsibility of the lead agency. So yeah, I think that's, um, that is true. Um, and that's why for this review, um, you know, we want to make sure that if there are errors, that those errors are being addressed and, and discovered, I guess. Um, because, you know, it is still the CCDF grant money that is at play here. Great. So now we're going to get more into the nitty gritty of conducting case record reviews. Specifically, we're going to discuss how to complete columns two, three, and four of the record review worksheet. And I'll show some examples, and there are lots more examples in the data collection instructions, so you can refer to those as well after this call. Uh, just keep in mind that, as I go through these examples, um, keep in mind that since columns one and two of the worksheet are customized by the state, the examples that I show will not look exactly like your own state's record review worksheet. So they're just hypothetical, but we will start in column two the analysis column. So this column usually includes a number of items with check boxes or fill in the blanks or uh, et cetera, drop downs. And again, these are customized to conform to the state's policies and procedures. 
So when you as reviewers are completing column two, be sure to answer all of the items unless you can't answer them because they're either not applicable or because you don't have enough information to answer them. And we always encourage states to include comment boxes and to make liberal use of them. If you can't, for example, answer one of the items in the analysis, you can use the comment box to explain why you couldn't answer it. And I list here some other uses of the comment box to like describe an error, show your math, for example, when you're calculating the subsidy amount. Uh, you can use comments to record documentation that was used to verify the element requirements or just capture anything else. You don't always have to have something in the comment boxes. You know, like I said, we encourage reviewers to use them, but if there's really nothing additional to say, then it's fine to leave that blank. Our last, um, the last general instruction that I'm giving here for completing column two is to make sure that you do not use any personally identif identifiable in information or PII in column two or anywhere else in the worksheet. So PII refers to anything that either by itself or when combined with other information could potentially be used to trace an individual, like a client, a child, a provider, or anyone else. So this can include things like names, birth dates, addresses, workplaces, provider names, and so on. And this is really important to avoid in your worksheet. We always want to make sure that clients and you know everyone else involved, their privacy is is um, you know being being protected here. So if you have any questions about using PII or what qualifies as PII, just let us know, and we are happy to help with that. So let's get into a couple of examples of completing column two. In this first example which again, I will revisit this example when we talk about column three and column four, but we'll start here with column two. This shows element 310 with no error. So going down to different items in column two, first the reviewer checked yes, because the parent is a re resident of the state. Then under that, there's a couple of items about verification of residency with instructions for reviewers to answer either one or the other based on the date of the case action, since there was a policy change. And I think that, you know, with especially with um, the pandemic and increased funds uh, to lead agencies, there's a lot of states that have policy changes like this on their worksheets. So here in this example, the reviewer answered the first of the items and left the second one blank. And in the comment box, the reviewer recorded what documentation was reviewed to verify residency. If this case action had taken place after the policy change, the parent would have been able to self-attest to their residency. So maybe in, in that case, maybe the reviewer would have just left that comment box blank because if they did not have anything additional to say, and that's fine. So this item was, one item here was left blank and that's okay since it was not applicable. So the next example shows element 100 and this one does have an error. So going down the column, the reviewer ticked yes because there was a signed application in the case record. Next, were all the forms correct? No. And I will we'll get back to that in a minute. And for the next two items that the family has declared that assets do not exceed $1 million, and was there a current service authorization, those are both ticked yes. The reviewer used the comment box to describe the error that the fourth page of the application had a couple of items that were incomplete. So in this example, I just show another use of the comment box to say what the error was.
So that was column two. And the important thing in column two is just to ensure that you have a thorough analysis of everything that's required in that element. And what is required in that element is, again, based on what is in column one, use both the boilerplate and the customization from the state. So when you move to column three, the reviewer will be summarizing those findings from column two. No new information should pre be presented in column three. We're just summarizing what we already know. And we'll be discussing column four shortly, but the reviewer should be able to complete column four just looking at the information that was given in three. So there's a couple of things that should always be included in three. You'll want to say whether the element has an error, and if it does, what kind of error was it? Was it a payment error, or was it an administrative slash non-payment error? Was the error caused by missing documentation or by something else? And if there was an error, you can state a little bit about, you know, what the nature of that error was, but try and keep it concise. And again, don't present any new information. And finally, the column should never be left blank, even if there was no error. And if there was no error, I'll show you in the next slide. This example shows element 310 again, and you can see in column three that it just says no error. So you don't need to say anything more. But again, it should not be left blank. In this slide, we show what column three might look like if there was an error. So this is the same example that we showed a few slides back, where in element 100, the application was there, but a few items were incomplete. In this date, this was considered to be an administrative error. And I'm not saying that this will necessarily be the case in your state as well. We understand that requirements vary based on your policies. Maybe this would be a payment error in your state. But at any rate, here it's a non-payment error. And looking at column three, the reviewer stated that there was an error. It was caused by missing document or missing or insufficient documentation, and it was an administrative error. And then there's a few words here about the cause of the error. So this is perfect for column three. It includes everything that we want to see here. And the reviewer would be able to code column four based on this information without needing to look at anything else in the element. So let's take a look now at the items in column four. Column four of the record review worksheet includes a number of items about the findings for the element, but instead of giving a narrative version of the findings, there's a coding scheme. So the first item just asks whether there was an error, and you would either enter zero for no error or one if there was one. Item two is asking whether there was, whether there was missing or insufficient documentation. So if there was not an error, you would code NA. It's not applicable. Code Y, if the element had an error that was caused by missing or insufficient documentation. And N, if there was an error, but it was not caused by missing documentation. So this is pretty straightforward, but we do see a lot of coding errors here, which a lot of times we see where it should have been coded NA, but instead it was coded as N, which is understandable. Um, but just be aware of that. The coding scheme is printed at the bottom of the record review worksheet template, so you can always refer to that for a you know, quick refresher. And the final item that you'll see in column four, this is actually only in 100 through 400, it's not in element 410. This one you're only going to fill in if you answered a Y for column two. It's about if there was missing documentation, is it a potential improper payment error? The only answer to this is if there was a mid error in the element. Mid meaning, sorry, I should have said this acronym already. Mid is what we say for short for missing or insufficient documentation. So if there was a mid error and it's something that would result in an improper payment, then you would code Y. 
And if there's a mid error, but it's administrative or non-payment, then you would enter N. So let's bring up our two examples again. So revisiting our first example where there's no, ele no error in element 310. Looking at column four, the first item is coded as zero because there was no error in the element. And item two is coded as NA. And since there was um, no error that, sorry, since item two was not coded as Y, 2A is left blank. And in our second example, this shows a this shows a mid administrative error. So how would we complete column four? First, item one is coded as one because there was an error in the element. The error was caused by insufficient documentation, so the reviewer entered Y for number two. And since they entered Y for item two, then the reviewer would would go on to code item two A. And we know just from glancing at column three that this was an administrative or non-payment error. It's not something that would result in an improper payment. So 2A, the reviewer entered N. And take a look at the wording here in 2A for the item. It mentions that if Y is coded, which it isn't here, but if we have coded Y, it says to use the mid table. So this is going to be my segue into the next section of the webinar, which is on completing the additional inquiry and the mid table. To start, I wanna take a step back and give a crash course on the different types of errors we look at in this review. And I've already used these terms a lot when showing these examples over the last few slides. But when a case has an eligibility error, it's going to fall into one of two categories. There are those that are caused by missing documentation or insufficient documentation, which again, we refer to as MID for short. And then there are the non-MID errors. So these are the types of errors that are caused by income out income miscalculation, applying the wrong copay, or just other misapplications of policy that don't involve documentation. Then looking at the mid errors, these can be broken down further into two types. There are the errors that cause improper payments, and there are those that do not cause improper payments, which we refer to either as non-payment or administrative errors, those two terms we use interchangeably. The non-MID errors can also be broken down into improper payments and administrative errors. So when we are talking about the MID table and the additional inquiry, we are focusing on just this one type of error. Those errors that are caused by MID and that could potentially cause an improper payment. What do we mean when we talk about the additional inquiry? If you were involved in the error rate review last cycle, this might be um, just a refresher for you, but basically this is a process by which those mid errors potentially causing an improper payment can be mitigated for the review. If you are able to show that despite the fact there was missing documentation in the case file, the child really was eligible for services. And what do we mean when we talk about the mid table? This is a part of the record review worksheet template. It shows up between elements 410 and 500. And it's used to record some data on those mid potential improper payment errors, regardless of whether an additional inquiry was conducted. 
The table, if you look at the rows, it is broken down by element. If you're doing a review and there are no mid potential and proper payment errors, then you would just leave this blank. But if you do have one or more, then you would fill out the table by referring to the row that represents the element with the error. So we've broken down um, the additional inquiry and mid table into a number of steps. The first step is just to determine whether the element has one of these mid potential improper payment errors. If so, if it does have one or more, I guess, determine whether an additional inquiry can be conducted. And if an additional inquiry can be conducted, then you would go ahead and do it. Step four is to fill in the mid table for the applicable element. And remember, this is done for any mid potential improper payment error, regardless of whether an additional inquiry was conducted. And finally, step five is to go back to that element and update with any new information that was found through the additional inquiry if you were able to do one. So let's go through these steps in a little more detail. So step one is again to determine if the element has a potential improper payment error caused by missing documentation or insufficient documentation. And here is where it's really important for reviewers to have a consistent understanding of the policies and procedures and error definitions. So what would make a case ineligible versus what would be considered an administrative error? So to illustrate this point, I have an example on the right of the screen. So while reviewing element 400, which is the element on financial requirements, let's say that the reviewer discovered that hard copies of pay stubs were missing from the file. However, the income information is available in the state system. So in some states, this might be a non-issue to begin with if everything is scanned into the system and there's no hard copies. But in this case, let's pretend that hard copies are a thing. They're expected to be in the file. But I think that you know, across states, we would see this handled in different ways, considered um, either a non, you know, no error at all, as long as that information is there in the system. In some states, this might be considered an administrative error. And in other states, it might be a potential improper payment error. If, you know, you're, you run into a scenario like this, or if you're working on deciding, or sorry, if you're working on um, defining errors for different elements, you know, this is something that we can help you with, but it really does come down to what your policy is. So here's a few examples um, to kind of illustrate that on deciding just if something is a mid potential and proper payment error. So in the first example, this is taken from element 340. So say that the case file is missing a school schedule to support hours of care. The reviewer contacts the local eligibility office who finds the missing schedule. So this would not be considered a mid potential improper payment error. And the reason for that is that the documentation, it wasn't there in the file when the you know, reviewer was looking at it, but it was in the hands of the local office the whole time. They just, for whatever reason, forgot to send it over to the review team. So in this case, it's considered to, you know, not really have been missing. It's something that you could note on your worksheet if you wanted to, but it wouldn't be considered an error. All right, in the next example, the application is missing a signature in element 100. 
According to the state's policy, the missing signature would not result in an improper payment. So this would also not be considered a mid-potential improper payment error. And the, the key phrase is, according to the state's policy, you know, we again recognize that in another state, it might be a mid-potential improper payment error. But here it would not be, so the mid-table would not be, would not be completed. Right, a couple of other examples. In element 400, there were pay stubs missing, which would cause an improper payment. An additional inquiry was conducted. So here, this would be a case where the mid-table would need to be completed. And then the final example from element 320, you know, employment, employment verification was missing, which would cause an improper payment. An additional inquiry was not conducted. Okay, so again, the key phrase, which would cause an, it would cause an improper payment. So yes, this is a mid-potential improper payment error, and the mid-table would need to be completed, even though an additional inquiry was not conducted. Going back to looking at an example of a record review worksheet, um, this is just showing, you know, what it might look like for um, an element that has a mid-potential improper payment error. So this is element 320, parental work training status. The first item is, does the parent meet a need for service? And the reviewer left this item blank because there was, that information was missing from the case file. They didn't, they couldn't answer it. The third item down is the required documentation needed to verify the need for service in the file. And that was answered no. In the comments, the reviewer explained that work verification was missing. Column three included a description of the error type. Again, kind of touching on all the different points we like to see here in column three, that there was an error. It was an improper payment error or a potential improper payment error. And it was caused by missing documentation. In column four, note that that item 2A and I, if you're looking closely here at a column four, you can see that the numbering is one, two, and A. That should say two A. I'm guessing that was some autocorrect thing. Um, but regardless, it should say two A. The reviewer answered two A as Y. So that's kind of the tip off that because it was answered as Y, that the mid table would need to be completed. So there was a question that just came in, um, and I'm going to address it really quickly. So if the documentation needed was found through additional inquiry, would it still be listed as a mid-table, or sorry, mid-error potential improper payment? And the answer to that question is yes, it's still considered a potential improper payment, even though it was um, mitigated through the additional inquiry, it still had the potential to be an improper payment. So we still consider it that and the mid table would still, you know, would be filled out to show, to show what was done for the additional inquiry. So that's a good question. So in this slide, I've combined steps two and three and just wanted to touch on what might be done for an additional inquiry. So I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, that the scope of the additional inquiry is expanding in the uh, in the proposed instructions. And I don't want to get too in-depth into this, but if you were around last cycle, you might recall that the additional inquiry was limited to resources that eligibility workers did not have access to and that they were not expected to use when determining eligibility. So in the revised instructions, we're proposing that reviewers be able to use essentially any resource, regardless of whether the eligibility worker should have used it. So they should still be resources that are kind of within the state. And here's some examples. 
um, these are examples that you know we've we've seen seen being used in states, electronic systems, reaching out to other assistance programs in which the clients have participated, like SNAP, TANIS, Medicaid, or just other state agencies that may be able to provide missing information. So, vital records, um, the employment employment agency, work number. Those are kind of what we've what we've seen being used in other states for the additional inquiry. Contacting local eligibility offices to check to see if they have missing documentation is allowed, but again, it's not considered to be additional inquiry. And third-party verification, such as reaching out to clients or employers, is never allowed. So please do not do that. And Kevin, I will get to your question in just a moment. So step four of the additional inquiry and mid-table process is to complete the mid-table. And I've given an example for that element 320. So let's say that the reviewer was able to do an additional inquiry. And so in the mid table, they would, the reviewer would refer to the row for element 320. In column two, describe the documentation that was missing or insufficient. And you just need to give like a brief description here. In column three, share the dollar amount of the improper payment or potential improper payment. Usually it's equal to the sample month payment amount. Um, sometimes we do see like partial payment errors and we always encourage reaching out for TA to help with that because it can get kind of confusing for everyone. In column four, this is where we ask, is there an additional inquiry that could be completed? And it's just a code zero for, for no additional inquiry or one for additional inquiry. I kind of mixed it up here in the instructions. Um, so I can change that and I will resend these slides out to everyone. I apologize. This should say zero for no AI and one for AI. Column five is if there is no additional inquiry that can be completed, this is where you would describe why not. And again, just a few words or a sentence is fine here. You don't need to, you know, write a ton. If an additional inquiry was done, you can just leave this one blank. If you did do an additional inquiry, you would um, briefly describe what that is. If the improper payment was able to be mitigated using the additional inquiry, you would code one here. If it was not able to be mitigated, you would code zero. In column eight, enter that dollar amount that was mitigated. And then finally in column nine, this is where you would describe how you determined if the improper payment could be mitigated or not. So these last four columns, six through nine, can just be left blank. If there's no additional inquiry, you would just fill out column five and then stop there. So say that you were able to you know, have an additional inquiry and it was successful and you've mitigated the improper payment. What we would ask you to do then is to complete step five, which is to update the element with any additional information. So for example, in this element 320 example, the reviewer was now able to say that yes, the parent did meet the need for service. However, since that documentation was still missing from the file, we're going to leave this item as checked as no. The reviewer updated the comments here, just to say that it was found through additional inquiry. And also mention in column three that, yes, there was still that potential improper payment error, but it was mitigated. Column four, we're going to leave this as is. 
again, that potential improper payment error was still there, so we're not going to change anything. So I did get in a few questions about this, so I want to address those. So first, from Kevin, um, if mitigated, it does not count against the final error tally, correct? So this is kind of half correct. Um, it is still going to be considered an administrative error if it's mitigated, but it's not going to count against your improper payment error tally. Slide 37, reviewers may consider resources. Yeah, is this now effective for year three states? So I think that, and then Wanda also, you said, so if a worker and reviewer have access to the same state system, the worker failed to use it, then can the re reviewer consider this for an additional inquiry this cycle? So the answer to that is, um, it's being proposed in the new data collection instructions. Um, I can follow up, we can follow up with you, Wanda, um, because again, since the instructions have not yet been approved, you know, technically we're still working under the old kind of way of doing things. Um, but yeah, we, let's follow up one-on-one -on -one to get a little bit more information about what maybe you, you know, might wanna be doing and if it's, um, you know, once the new instructions are approved, then is a sign that maybe you can kind of circle back to. All right, we only have a few minutes left, but um, I do want to quickly talk about element 500, which is our summary element. This is what it looks like. It's the last element of the record review worksheet. And there's some coding instructions, and the coding instructions are essentially the same for these two items as you would see in the elements you know, 100 through 410, except you're looking at the entire case instead of just you know that particular element. So you know essentially you're going to be coding zero or one. If the case has no errors, you'll code zero. If there's any error, you'll code one. And then in item two, you will be coding about uh, whether the, if there is an error, was it caused by missing documentation? If there's more than one error, it can be a little bit tricky. You know, am I gonna code this? Why? If there's mid errors and non mid errors, it can be a little tricky to know which to code for. I kind of laid it all out here and there's also some good examples in the data collection instructions. So I would, if you do run into a case that has multiple errors in different elements, then I would, you know, highly encourage you to take a look at that. Next in element 500 column two, there's a number of items about the mid table and additional inquiry. And really all of these, um, I'm not going to go through each of them individually, but they can all just be pulled from information in the mid table. If you did not have any of those mid in potential improper payment errors, you can just leave these blank or enter zero for all of them. Again, these, these items 2A through 2E only apply if you've completed the mid table for any elements. The last few items in element 500 column two are shown here. Item three is asking if there was an overpayment or underpayment. And you would code either O, U, or NA. Item four is asking for the amount of the improper payment if there was one. And then finally, item five is asking for the total payment amount for the sample month. Now I do have a few examples and in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over these right now, um, but I encourage you to take a look at them after the webinar and you know, reach out to, to me or to Janae or um, any of us on the error rate team and we can certainly help you with this. I did want to bring up, since we only have a couple minutes left, 
Um, I did want to mention that we are going to be offering um, office hours, and I have a question mark here because we haven't settled on a date and time yet. Um, but during office hours, you know, usually we use this as a time for states to just kind of drop in and ask any questions they have about conducting reviews or anything else related to error rate. And since we just skipped these last three examples for completing element 500, when we do hold office hours, I can go ahead and walk through those examples during that time. A couple of other um, things that we can offer for TA support, we can check through completed record review worksheets just to make sure that they are being completed correctly. If you have any questions on coding or, you know, is this an error or not? We will hold a joint case review with each state. We've already had a few with the year three states. And this is usually done when your state has completed about three months worth of case reviews. So if you have completed three or more months of case reviews and we have not yet set up that joint case review, please reach out to your regional office and we can get that scheduled. We don't want to, we don't like to wait too, too long to do that. And again, you know, reach out to your regional office to request any technical assistance. I think that a couple of other questions have come in. And I will, yeah, okay, and I think that this question, we can follow up after the call on this since it seems to be kind of specific to your, to your, um, Kind of state situation. So yeah, I will uh, email you Anna after this is done and we can follow up on that. Um, as always, we really, really appreciate you joining us today. There is going to be a evaluation that pops up as you close out of here. So if you can take a few minutes to complete that and you can also use that evaluation to ask any follow-up questions. As always, you can reach out to any of us on our error rate team. But yeah, thank you. Thank you again so much for joining us. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your November. Thank you all. Take care. Bye bye.